So thanks a lot for the introduction. Yes, I'm, I'm Michele, and together with uh, Jean-Luc Salin, today we want to give you uh, first a high-level overview over um, what's happening on, on our instruments when generating a signal. And then in the second part, we want to uh, look at some, discuss some solutions, how to characterize these signals then in the lab. And so this morning before the break, uh, Clemens has actually shown us how one can use Lab1Q to, to run an experiment. So for example, starting here from a pointer. Here, there we go. Uh, starting, for example, here from a uh, from a circuit level description, which could, for example, come from Qiskit, and then Lab1Q takes care of of all of the steps in between that are needed to to generate the control signals then for the experiment. But so yes, while while Lab1Q takes care of this, here in this talk now we want to have a bit of a glimpse under the hood and actually show the engine that's running on our instruments uh, that actually takes care of of generating these signals. And for this, um, exactly, yes, it, this takes care here of, of generating these, uh, these signals. And we want to do this mostly also to, uh, yes, to provide some understanding of what's actually happening and then to, to also provide some understanding what's, uh, what's feasible and what's convenient to run. And so here, if we, if we say that we want to run an experiment, so we want to perform operations on a quantum system, so we want to manipulate some quantum states. And here, for the easy case of a, of a single qubit state, we can represent this here on, on this block sphere. And operations we can now perform are, on one hand, like x or y gates, so to, to excite the qubit. And these, for superconducting qubits, are realized by microwave drive pulses at the qubit frequency. And so here, uh, the angle of rotation here around this block sphere, this, for example, also scales with the pulse amplitude. Then on the other hand, we can also perform Z gates, so effectively uh, corresponding to, to a detuning of the qubit frequency, uh, which can either realize by flux pulses on the qubit, or instead by updating of the, of the reference frame of our drive pulses, so by changing phase offsets for the microwave drive pulses that we use for the X and Y gates. So effectively, this would then be a, a virtual Z gate. And so now let's look at a concrete use case where you can now study the, the anatomy of the, of the pulses that we want to use to, to run an experiment. And so here, I want to show as an example uh, that where we want to, to explain the signal generation, uh, we want to measure the, the EF transition frequency in a, in a Qtrit. And so this we can do with a, with a Ramsey type experiment, effectively, but with some added finesse to it. And so, uh, like on, on first level, so for a Ramsey experiment, we want to sweep the time delay between two pi half pulses. But then to, uh, uh, to make the, the data analysis more robust, we actually want to, to do this in a frame which is detuned to a qubit frequency. And so this we generate by, by introducing some virtual Z gates in our sequence. And then finally, we said we wanted to measure the, the F transition frequency. And so for this, we first need to bring our qubit in the excited state. And this we do by prepending a GE pi pulse in the beginning of, uh, of each shot. So now, we want to generate a sequence. And for this, now let's look how the signal generation is set up. And so here, the, the signal generator then in the end will, will drive the qubit in our cryostat. And this generator now consists on one hand of a digital part, which is responsible for synthesizing the control pulses. And also thanks to some, uh, some additional features like uh, some, some real-time control over pulse parameters, uh, here we can really generate complex sequences in a scalable way. Then on the other hand, we also want to consider the, the analog part, uh, for, for which is responsible to then actually um, provide the signal at qubit frequency with the appropriate power. And so this one will then enable us to, to allow for fast and high fidelity gates. So now let's jump back to our, to our example and first consider now the digital part. And so what's needed to generate this example is first we need to make sure that we have uh, full control of pulse timing. 
And this will be realized by, by a sequencer, uh, which is responsible for a system-wide timing control of the sequence, of, of the operations in the sequence. Then second part, we need control over the pulse parameters. And so here we can make use of the waveform memory for the arbitrary waveform generator uh, to, to really save uh, the pulses in a, in a sample precise way. And then additionally, we also have, again, real-time control or pulse parameters here specifically over the scaling of the amplitude uh, or scaling of this waveform. And then also we need to take care of the, an appropriate carrier signal. Uh, which is provided then by hardware oscillators in the device. And also here we'll have, we'll see that we have real time control, the node parameters of the frequency and the phase. So how does this all play together? And a core engine in our instruments is the digital signal modulation. And here actually, Niklas this morning already gave a, a very nice introduction of, uh, of the functionality here. And so basically to, to recap uh, the Two main components for, for this digital modulation are on one hand the pulse envelope that we can save in a sample precise way on the waveform memory. Where in addition, we, thanks to the real-time control of some parameters, uh, we, we can really build a memory efficient architecture here. And then on the other hand, we provide the, the carrier frequencies with hardware oscillators on the FPGA, which allow for very high coherent signals. And also here, we have additionally the real-time control over frequency and phase, which on one hand can allow very fast frequency sweeps in, the, in hardware. And then since we have multiple oscillators per channel, we can also allow the switching between oscillators um, in, on one channel here. And then these two components are then combined with our digital mixer to then generate the here the intermediate frequency output signal. So now, again, for our, for our example, for the, for the EF Ramsey measurement, this means now we can decompose our sequence into these two main parts, which are here on one hand, the, the envelope, and then the carrier frequencies. And so now let's have a look what these two components, what this actually means for the experiments. And so let's first look at the, at the baseband signal, so at the envelopes, where we have, the, we have access to the to sample precise pulse envelopes. And so now here we see that it's very convenient that we have the timing control over the, the playback of these individual waveforms here, because now we can just employ the sequencer to handle the, the delay time uh, for, for our sweep and do not need to save zero waveforms to actually space these pulses, but just handle this fully by, by sequence instructions. And then additionally, we also have access to scaling of the amplitudes or scaling of the waveforms. And so now this will allow us to very easily reuse these pulse envelopes. Uh, for example, here, if we, if we consider that the difference between the pi and the pi half pulse would just be a scaling of the amplitude, then here in this example, we could actually just use one single waveform for uh, in waveform memory to run the full sequence. So then looking at the, uh, at the carrier signal, uh, so which is provided by the hardware oscillators. So now here we see that since we have real-time access to, to modification of the carrier phase, we can actually now use this to implement virtual Z gates and effectively just uh, change, introduce phase jumps here at specific points, which are then timed with the pulse envelopes to include a virtual Z gate for a, for a pulse in the playback. And then additionally, since we can switch between oscillators, we can now use one oscillator for the G transition carrier and one oscillator for the F transition carrier, and effectively now address different transitions um, back to back or by playing pulses back to back uh, on these two different on these two different oscillators, and can do this in a phase coherent way. So yes, so far we have looked mostly at the at the digital part of the signal generation, but let's also have a, a short a short glimpse actually to the to the analog part. 
And so here we use a, uh, so this analog part, as mentioned before, is, is now responsible for, for upconverting the signal to the qubit frequency. And here we use a double superheterodyne upconversion scheme. And so this one allows us to, to access a wide frequency band, for example, for, for multiplexing of control pulses. Uh, and this, all of this without the need to, to perform mixer calibration on the signal. So here, this, this technique or the, the, the design of this, actually there is some complexity to it. Uh, so here, I just want to flash a slightly more detailed representation of the, uh, of the scheme as, as compared to the, to the sketch we've shown before. Um, but also here, it's important to note that this complexity, this is fully encapsulated in the design. And so basically, this is taken care of. And so then for the experiment in the lab, the, the way we can really think about this is just as a, effectively a, an up conversion, so effectively a mixer, like in the, in the simplified diagram. And then also here, the settings that are needed, uh, like the, the frequencies of the LOs or the, um, or the, the output range settings, so the, the, the amplification of the amplifiers. So this also can then be fully configured in Lab1Q and also be taken care of by, by Lab1Q for the, uh, pro, yeah, for the program of the experiment. Okay, yes, so now we actually have really looked a bit at the intricacies of, of how to run an experiment. But now to round off, I actually want to just briefly flash of how the experiment, how the sequence that we discussed so far would actually look like if I now want to, to run it in the lab. And for this, I, I want to show that this demo code in Lab1Q, uh, similar to, to how Clemens explained it to us this morning, uh, just to, to recap how this looks like really for, for the pulse sequence we wanted to discuss. And so effectively, what we want to do to perform this, the sweep, we want to, again, uh, just start with a, with a sweep statement here over the, this delay time, uh, and then in a simultaneous way over the, the phase of the virtual Z gates. And then we just play our excitation pulse on the, at the GE frequency, so we play our 180 pulse, and then directly followed by the, by the Ramsey sequence, so on the, on the, at the Ramsey drive frequency, we play first our, pi, our first pi half pulse, uh, then our delay, which is swept, and then our second pi half pulse, which includes the, the virtual Z phase. And with this, basically all the complexity that, that we had discussed here is happening behind the scenes and is, is covered here in the software framework. Okay, so with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to take questions, maybe before uh, handing over to, to Jean-Luc Sela. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Jean-Luc Sela. So I'm from uh, Rode Schwartz, Switzerland. I'm a sales engineer covering the French speaking part. And today I'm going to shortly introduce you to the Rode Schwartz instrument that maybe you, you are using, and thank you for that. Uh, and I will focus, because I'm an oscilloscope expert, I will focus on one key features of the oscilloscope from, uh, from Rode Schwartz. So today in the quantum computing or quantum uh, uh, labs, you will find uh, different uh, instruments uh, from uh, Rode Schwartz, uh, mainly uh, high-end uh, uh, RF uh, uh, analyzer, uh, network analyzer, you know, to do uh, like uh, resonance frequency measurement, uh, spectro spectroscopy, also um, uh, spectrum analyzer, high-end spectrum analyzer for uh, noise characterization, uh, components characterization, and also very famous, uh, maybe the most famous one, the SGS uh, 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 generator. You can use it for 6 to uh, 40 gigahertz uh, up conversion for frequencies, for generation, and also uh, maybe the best uh, reference uh, you can buy on the market, the SMA100B, uh, that is a very, very uh, low phase noise uh, generator. So all these, uh, uh, let's say, standard uh, uh, instruments are available from uh, Rode Schwartz. And today I'm, I will focus on the SCOP, or SCOP, uh, oscilloscope uh, uh, solutions from uh, Rode Schwartz. Um, so what do we need an oscilloscope for? It's mainly a time domain uh, analysis, and uh, it, it's, it's used, uh, the oscilloscope is used to characterize uh, pulse, so pulse levels, time, 
pulse with synchronization between channels. And for that, you need accurate uh, uh, oscilloscope. And I will show you the, the main uh, advantage of the Rode Schwartz uh, oscilloscope now. So first, um, I want to, to show you the, the full portfolio. So we have very uh, low-end oscilloscope, but also uh, we have the new MXO4 and MXO5 up to 2 gigahertz. This is brand new uh, oscilloscope from Rode Schwartz. Uh, the MXO4 is here, and I will show you something from, uh, from this one. Uh, and also we have the high-end uh, oscilloscope uh, uh, the RTP and the RTO6. We have up to 16 gigahertz uh, bandwidth. Uh, maybe uh, sometimes not enough, but uh, be sure that uh, Rode Schwartz is uh, now uh, uh, working on the high end uh, and the uh, larger uh, bandwidth. So, um, yeah, so the, the um, oscilloscope from uh, Rode Schwartz, uh, what do we have um, uh, as a main advantage? Uh, and I will focus on this. Uh, we have a digital trigger. So I will uh, give you some more details on this uh, feature. Uh, we have also very low noise uh, front end. And uh, because uh, Rode Schwartz is designing the amplifiers, the ADC uh, ourselves, and uh, with the goal to, uh, to, to have the lowest uh, uh, noise on the, on the market. And also, uh, we provide the oscilloscope with very long memories that you can store and, uh, and uh, save a long uh, sequence of pulse. Okay. So just uh, one key, uh, key point on oscilloscope I would like to focus is uh, because I, I learned by experience that uh, a good uh, speak is uh, focusing on the very uh, key points. And that's uh, uh, what, what is uh, the difference between an oscilloscope with a digital trigger and analog trigger. So maybe you, you don't know this, so I, I like to, to share with this. So historically, uh, oscilloscopes um, are designed uh, like this. So you have uh, here the input signals, and there is a part who goes to the ADC for digitalization, and, uh, and you, you will put the, the data in the memory uh, if you signal meet a valid trigger condition, okay? And to decide uh, if a, a valid uh, trigger condition is met, uh, you need traditionally to uh, split the signal and to go to a dedicated trigger system. And this, this trigger system will tell the, the acquisition processing, yes, it's a valid uh, trigger, you can put the, the data in the memory. Uh, there are a few issues with this sort of architecture. Uh, first, when you split a signal, for sure you, you are creating some, uh, some uh, um, uh, interference, so you, you will decrease the level, you will have some uh, reflection, etc. So it's not good to, to have this sort of, uh, of uh, system. And also, uh, if you have a, a separate trigger system to the, to the ADC, uh, here you will have a different, uh, a different bandwidth, for example, and also so maybe you will have uh, uh, some jitter on top of the of the system. So it's going to uh, to degrade the quality of your acquisition. Now, um, when Rode Schwartz uh, came to the to the uh, to the market of uh, oscilloscope, uh, we've done something interesting. Uh, we remove this uh, trigger system. And uh, we are, uh, in fact, not using a, a dedicated trigger system here. So we go directly from the input to the ADC. And we use uh, the data, the samples from the, from the ADC on, uh, on the fly to decide if the trigger is valid or not. So the big advantage of this is you do not degrade the, the signal because you are, you are not uh, splitting the signal. Also, uh, you have a much more uh, sensitivity because you are deciding on the ADC values, uh, the, uh, the bits, uh, which if the condition is met. So that's a very nice uh, way to do it. And then you reduce the noise, the vertical noise, the horizontal noise because the trigger uh, jitter is very limited. So this is a very nice uh, uh, new innovation we introduced uh, a few years ago. Now we have this uh, unique, uh, this architecture on the high end, RTP, RTO, but also on the MXO5 and MXO4. And we are the only one with this sort of uh, scope with a digital trigger. So, so for, for example, uh, with this 
and I will show you a demo uh, later. With this, you, you are able to trigger on the very small uh, signals. Why? Because you have a sensitivity of triggering up to uh, down to 0001 division. And uh, we have also a uh, uh, possibility to, uh, to uh, use some uh, uh, processing on the data and you can still trigger after the data are processed. So this is very, very innovative and very, uh, very nice. I will show you a demo. Okay, so for example, uh, we have our high-end uh, RTP with a digital trigger. Uh, also, what is important uh, with this is uh, um, uh, accurate level measurement. So we have a flat response, uh, frequency response, I will show you. Uh, also very, uh, very uh, low uh, drift and very good stability. Uh, so with this sort of uh, oscilloscope, we have really a, a good tool to, uh, to characterize your pulse. So this is the flat uh, uh, frequency response over the the, uh, the full bandwidth. You can see it's uh, it's quite nice, and also um, on the MXO four and five now five we have introduced the first eight channel uh, oscilloscope from Rode Schwartz up to two gigahertz with a twelve bit ADC, very fast processing and digital trigger. Okay. You can even run four FFT at the same time on this uh, five series, uh, Scott. Yeah, and just to show you, yeah, the low noise front end of the MXO5. So this is the, the time domain on the top and the uh, FFT on the on the uh, bottom. You can see uh, it's a 12 bit ADC, so we can reach more than 100 dBm uh, of uh, dynamic. So the noise is below 100 dBm, and also you see there's no spurious on the on the scope. Uh, okay, so let me switch now to to a demo. I will show you the the, the trigger. Uh, okay, let me just show you. So we we are showing the screen of the scope uh, through uh, the LAN. So I'm going to um, to come here. So, so this is a, a signal. It's uh, generated by the the uh, Zurich Instrument Generator. We have. Uh, in fact, two pulse. There is a very small pulse and a very large pulse. And uh, normally, when you, you use a trigger, you see there is uh, this uh, line that is a trigger level plus uh, the light blue uh, zone. And the light blue zone is uh, what we call hysteresis. Okay, hysteresis is a is a level that uh, uh, your signal needs to to uh, to go through. To have a valid trigger, this is historically good because uh, this is uh, uh, the feature to make sure that you are not triggering on noise on your on your signal. And uh, you can see uh, with uh, uh, Rode Schwartz uh, oscilloscope, we show you the the trigger level and also the hysteresis zone. So if we, if I go below the the signal here. You see, there's no more trigger because uh, the signal is not crossing this uh, hysteresis zone. The very nice thing with the uh, uh, Rode Schwartz uh, instrument is uh, if you if you go to the trigger uh, menu, you can go and uh, you see there is a hysteresis uh, control. So you can you can choose the hysteresis and then you can say I want my hysteresis manually control and I can go and this is something you have to to know what you are doing. But I, I can tell. My scope, no, I don't want any more hysteresis. That means I'm triggering, triggering on the uh, one bit level. You know, if I, as soon as there is a signal, I will trigger. Uh, well, that's maybe uh, dangerous if you have a noisy uh, signal, but uh, it's also good because uh, if I want to trigger on a very small signal below here, and you see, let me, let me close this. So now, now if I, uh, where is it? Oh. I don't, yeah. So now if I go to the to the very low level here, and you will see I now now I'm triggering, I can trigger on this on this very uh, small uh, pulse here. So that's the way you can do. You have to know what you are doing, but uh, this is something you can do. I can even go up. So I'm trying on the big pulse, but I can even try to to capture the small uh, the small level here, you know. So that's that's very nice uh, uh, feature. Okay. 
I'm done.